Hi everyone, Chris Newhart here. We have a special episode at Iris Place, and I'm here today with Tiffany Barnes. Heck yeah, and thank you so much for taking the time to come and do this interview. I greatly appreciate it. I'm sure most of my audience is familiar that I was just recently on your show. Yes. Which uh, I greatly appreciate it because it was the first time I ever got to publicly uh, talk about my trauma and I haven't really talked about it in a long time period so it was very therapeutic and I was very happy to see like how many of my listeners actually listened to it and all the feedback from them and it was just an amazing experience and greatly appreciated it. It was awesome having you on. I've gotten so much feedback as well like just people resonating with your story and how they've been through similar things so thank you. Yeah, yeah it was awesome how they were saying that and they were like you know you sound more like a, a survivor than a victim and and it was just good to talk to other people I've been through the same thing because like anything you know peace can only I feel peace can only be reached through communication so you know, a lot of times, I mean, at least for me personally, when I thought I let go of trauma, you know, it's like anything, it's like meditation or working out in the gym, I realize you have to keep letting go, you have to keep exercising that, because it's, you know, you can't get rid of trauma one or two times, you know, so, right, exactly. but I think talking to you really, you know, helped in a bigger way than normal, so, you know, if anyone isn't aware, you know, she's got an awesome podcast, and we're going to talk more that, about that in a moment, but yeah, for people that you know aren't familiar with you and your work, could you kind of describe uh, a little bit of who you are and what you do? Well, sure. So I've already said my name. I'm Tiffany Barnes. Uh, I was emancipated at 13 years old from my parents due to abuse. So uh, kind of a long story short, by the time I was 13, I'd suffered all forms of abuse, you know, physical, sexual, emotional, you name it. And my stepfather at the time was a very... Uh, you know, tall, violent, uh, bad-tempered man, if you will, and somebody who, when my mother and him would fight, she would get hauled away in an ambulance sometimes. And so, you know, he started sexually abusing me, and he said, if you say anything to anybody, I'll kill you. Well, when you're 13 years old, and a grown man threatens your life and says, you say anything about this abuse, I'll kill you, you believe him, you know, especially right. because of the violence that was going on in the home. and. You know, I kept my mouth shut for almost a year. This just kept going on as a daily occurrence. And my mother, unfortunately, was a, a drug addict. She's still a drug addict to this day. Somebody who's never really cared about my life or what was going on in my life. Um, I felt very much like a, like a paycheck to her as far as like child support. She didn't really spend time with me or ask me how school was going or things like that. And the reason I say that is because there was a morning I was getting ready for school and she came downstairs where my bedroom was and she had asked me about the relationship between myself and my stepfather. And I thought, well, that's weird. She never cares anything about what's going on in my life, you know? Yeah. And um, she asked me, and so I was kind of dumbfounded by that. But then also on the other side, I was thinking, well, if I say anything, he's going to kill me. So I covered up, you know, I said, I don't know what you're talking about, you know. Um, uh, maybe, you know, she had actually inquired why it had taken him so long to wake me up that morning. And I said maybe he was doing laundry or ch changing a furnace filter or whatever. And she inquired again. She goes, no, tell me what's going on. What's going on between you and Robert? That was his name. And I thought to myself, okay, again, mom's never cared about what's going on in my life. Maybe this one time she'll protect me. So I told her. I told her about the sexual abuse and what was going on and she seemed furious at the time. I uh, called him home from work and we had a family meeting around the kitchen table. And I just kind of let it all out and said these are the things that happened and recounted all the details. And he denied everything and basically gave my mother an ultimatum. You know, he said that I was lying and none of those things happened and said it's your daughter or me. And my mom didn't even hesitate two seconds, it felt like. And she said, you have until tomorrow to get the bleep out of my house. So here I was telling a trusted adult about the abuse that had endure I had endured, 
hoping that that would be a safe place. And instead, it made me homeless at 13 years old. So you can imagine, you know, I went through, I was just kind of like a, a zombie in a trance, if you would. Um, like, where am I going to go? What am I going to do? You know, again, why am I not being protected? And um, I was in the eighth grade. I checked myself out of school and hopped on the UTA bus, which is our local bus system here, and took it into downtown Salt Lake City. Prior to jumping on the bus, when I was coming home from school that day, my mother was having a yard sale selling all of my stuff. Wow. So you can imagine, you know, walking up <laughs> and all of your things are like strewn across the lawn and your mother's selling them. You know, I felt like I was worth more to her as a dime, a quarter, or a penny, or a dollar for something at a yard sale than I was as her own flesh and blood child, daughter. I was the firstborn child. You know, you think you'd have some attachment there. Yeah. So jumped on the bus, went and lived with my biological father, which he was very physically abusive to me until my parents divorced. So I was very worried I was exchanging one abuse for another and um, became anorexic and suicidal and thought I was the most disgusting person on the planet. I thought if my mother who gave me life doesn't want me, why be here? And so I made several attempts to end my life. And there was a morning I woke up and I said to myself, today's gonna be the day. Today's gonna be the day I end my life. I don't wanna be here anymore. There's no reason for me to be here anymore and um, there was like, it was kind of a devil and an angel situation where the devil said, yeah, end it all. You shouldn't be here. You're ugly. You're disgusting. You know, all of that. And then there was the angel that said, you know, Tiffany, if you do this, you're letting this defeat you and you're worth more than this and you are worthy and you are beautiful and all these things. And so I basically reached out to somebody and said, here's what I'm about to do to myself. I need help. Will you help me? And they did. They said, just promise me when I call back, you'll pick up that phone. You're, you're still going to be living and breathing. And so I kept that promise and answered the phone when they called back. And it took me two years of a lot of help and counseling and working with a social worker and, you know, all of that, um, that I became a legally emancipated minor. I was the second case in the state of Utah at the time. So I was the second person at 15 years old to be a legally emancipated minor. So I'm in high school at that point. I could check myself in and out of school, literally. Like I would write my own notes, if you can imagine. Like I remember I went into one of my Spanish classes. It was like third period or something. And I wrote, please excuse Tiffany Barnes for being late. Thank you, Tiffany Barnes. And I handed it to the teacher. Right. And there's this kid on the front row, and he's like, well, wait a second, I don't write my own notes. i got to have mom and dad write them or whatever. And um, I was kind of known in high school as the girl with the special circumstance. And people were like, did your parents die? Why are you living on your own? You know, kids are inquisitive. And I would tell them, no, I was abused. You know, I went through all this abuse, and I went and stood before a judge and emancipated myself, and I pay $500 a month rent for a basement apartment, clear across town. I was living by the University of Utah, but going to school at Kearns High. And um, it was like this, I call it a Tiffany epiphany. I had this light bulb that went off and said, this is the reason you didn't take your life. And that reason is, the more I shared my story with people, my peers, the more of my peers started coming out of the woodwork and saying, I'm being abused. I know someone who's being abused. Because I was vulnerable enough to share my story, right. they thought it was okay to share theirs. And I started the support group for kids that were going through abuse, just like me. That's so sad. And we called it SHARE. And at the time, Share. <laughs> yes. This is uh, from our last Youth Empowerment Day. So SHARE NOW stands for Sharing Hope for the Abused through Resilience and Empowerment. And you can see there on the back of the shirt, 
Um, we had a young girl who's been through a very traumatic situation draw what empowerment meant to her. And so we transferred them onto these shirts. But the support group <coughs> back in 1998 stood for students helping the abused react and empower. And, and that was the reason I started it. I just wanted people to feel they weren't alone in their abuse. And to learn to react in a positive way so that, you know, I went to Kearns High, which if anybody watching this knows Kearns High, there's a lot of gangs there, there's a lot of drug activity, you know, it's not like a super straight lay school. Right. So it was very easy for us to turn to like teenage pregnancy or gangs or drugs, you know, all those things. And so it was just something where we could get together, share our story, but feel empowered through each other's story in the sense that we are reversing the cycle of abuse. And then somebody in our group told somebody at Granger High School, and then another high school, and then it started wow. getting put into different high schools. And then I had people asking me to come and share my story to elementary schools, junior highs, high schools. And that's what began my speaking career at 18 years old. Um, and it, it gave me such a fortunate opportunity to turn it into a 501c3 nonprofit that it is today. So we're talking 24 years later. Wow. Almost. And hats off to you doing public speaking at 18 years old. I think yeah. most people's <laughs> biggest fear is public speaking oh, over it. death. You yeah. know? <laughs> so. Oh, yes. I hated it when, it first, when I first started doing it. Yeah. <laughs> But it really filled my cup, you know? And I'm sure you understand this too. You know, as scary as it is getting in front of people, I had that platform to say, you know, this doesn't have to define you. Abuse doesn't have to be a crutch in your life. It can be a stepping stone to a better life. And I think a lot of times, you know, I don't know the specific number, but I wanna say between 80 and 90% of all people that are in prison right now, incarcerated, have suffered some form of abuse. Right. So if you look at the correlation, people who've been through abuse going to prison, do you think maybe some of those people never dealt with it? And it may have had some impact on why they became criminals? Oh yeah. You know, it's something that's such a, there's such a stigma around saying you've been abused until the Me Too movement recently came out. And so, um, yeah, I just get up every single day in hopes that I can affect one life, that they too can overcome abuse. Heck yeah, that's awesome. I greatly appreciate you doing that. Yeah, thank you. It means a lot. <laughs> For real. And, and and so with doing that, is that what led up to you doing your podcast and using that as a vehicle to kind of uh, just be a part of what you're doing with your charity and just bring people together? And Yeah, absolutely. So my podcast is called The Speak Loud Podcast. And I thought long and hard about what I was going to call it. And the reason I chose the, you know, the, the sentence speak loud or the, you know, why I wanted to call it that, I guess you, if you will, is because I want people to speak loud about what they've been through, but also speak loud about this is an epidemic and something can be done to make it better. Right. You know, I saw something once on the side, it was like painted on the side of a garage and it said, speak loud even if your voice shakes. And I thought that was so true because it's so important to speak loud about something, whether it's, you know, going through abuse or leaving an abusive relationship or, you know, there's so many things that people go through that they just, they're too scared. They keep it inside. Right. So even if your voice is shaky and you're scared to say, yes, this has happened, I want people to be able to come out and say, I've been abused, and then help themselves to overcome it. Heck yeah, and, and uh, with the, the support group, I think it's awesome, because like, I didn't even think about it until recently, I was in Florida, and uh, I was uh, just at the beach, and there was some uh, military that were like marching by, and I uh, thought, talked to their media director and coordinator, and they uh, get together because, you know, uh, if they're suicidal instead of like just sitting there being by themselves, they'll call up on the group and they'll all go see a movie together or go read a book together or go out to the bar together, you know, and it's like, I think that's really important, especially now more than ever during, you know, COVID and the pandemic and everyone being shut in, 
Um, I've you know heard and seen that domestic violence has gone up. Yes. You know, people are cooped in. Yes. You know, so um, yeah. You know, uh, for for people that aren't aware, you know, could you give out your um, website for the the charity again and we'll go over again, you know, before we end it. But sure. So it's speak. Or I was thinking of my podcast. Sorry. ShareTheMovement.org. So the website is www.sharethemovement.org. And the reason I chose Share the Movement as the website because I want people to share the movement to stop abuse one person at a time. And I think it's so important. We can reverse the cycle. Unfortunately, based on the numbers, it's not going to happen overnight. Um, I don't know if you're aware, but it's one in four women and one in six men before the age of 18 suffer some form of abuse. Wow. And the number one form of abuse is sexual abuse. Yeah. Um, sadly, the state we live in, Utah, is uh, one of the number one states for domestic violence and sexual abuse in the United States. Wow. I did so, not know that. Yeah. It's really close to home here. Um, the numbers aren't getting any better. You mentioned domestic violence during COVID. I would not be surprised if those numbers get worse because of COVID. You know, people cooped up. Um, they can't go out. Like for me, school was a solace, you know? Yeah. My parents couldn't, I guess they could have, but I felt they couldn't keep me from school. And I knew if I was at school, I wouldn't get hit. Right. I wouldn't get verbally abused. I wouldn't get sexually abused, you know? And so it was a way for me to shine as well. Like I loved, I was a straight A student, got a full ride scholarship to college. Um, despite living on my own and work, working three jobs my senior year, because I think I thrived on hearing those teachers give me those like gold stars, or those out of boys or out of girls, because I didn't get it from my parents. Yeah. You know. And with that, how your parents around, do you think that it kind of gave you the uh, advantage to like really be you and not have someone telling you what to do, what career you need to be? Sure. You know, did that give? Do you think you found some kind of like freedom in that? That was that you were able to, like go go your own path. I think so. Um, you know, I want to be fully transparent. Even now at 38 years old, I'm somebody who's still waiting for my father's approval. Yeah. Um, so like, you know, we're going to talk about this later, but I ran the torch and, you know, I went to, to school on a full scholarship and I've done some really notable things in my life. And my dad still never told me he's proud of me. Right. And that really bothers me. And I feel like sometimes I get up every day just waiting for him to finally say it. And so, um, that's to my detriment sometimes. But you know, you're right, I didn't have mom and dad saying, go to school, go be a lawyer, a doctor, an attorney, or anything like that. Um, but I feel I missed out in a lot of ways too. You know, I was being an adult in high school. You know, they got to go home to warm, cozy beds and a meal on the table where I was eating like kidney beans and crackers for a week and hiding out with the lights off because I couldn't pay rent, you know? and. Right. Um, in a way, I, I didn't get to be a kid, and so that part sucked. Yeah. But I do like that, yeah, I did get to kind of choose my own path and uh, be who I wanted to be. Heck yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, speaking of uh, the torch, you know, for people who aren't familiar, could you tell people a little bit more about that? Like, yeah. how you uh, ended up being the one to like the torch to the Olympics here and out in Salt Lake City, Utah. I mean, yeah. and then you know, follow up to that, you know, how what kind of amazing feeling was that, you know? <laughs> sure. I know you wanted me to bring it, and I, I would have. Um, I have it at home. You've seen it. Yeah. It's in my podcast room, but I'm just so worried. It's still got the original soot from the flame, but that's awesome. Um, so if you'll remember, in the 2002 Winter Olympics, the theme was light the flame within. Yeah. And at this point in time. Uh, so I graduated class of 2000, this was 2002, so two years after graduating high school. Wow. <laughs> um, I had been giving a lot of talks and speeches to administration and schools and things like that, and um, they had a contest of sorts where you could nominate somebody who had inspired you to light your flame within. Well, somebody had sent in an anonymous essay about me telling them how I had inspired them to light their flame within. So to this day, I don't know who wasn't nominated me. I still have the, the essay. Yeah. But I got this letter in the mail. I was in college, and I was living with some roommates. And you know, you check the mail, see what's yours, you put theirs, theirs away. 
well, I had this letter that was, it had the Olympic insignia, and it was addressed to me, and I thought it was an advertisement of some sort, and I almost threw this thing away. For real? It's crazy. <laughs> if I would have thrown it away, what, what it would have done, you know, if they would have tried to reach me again. But So I ended up, like, setting it down, coming back, and I open up this envelope, and I pull out this letter, and there's an essay attached to it. Long story short, the letter basically said, as a result of this essay, somebody has nominated you to be a torchbearer for the 2002 Winter Olympics. Would you like to do it? Check yes or no. And the person paid for me to keep my torch, which wow. was like almost $2,000 or something. Wow. So I check yes, <laughs> I send it back, and I got to run the final torch relay day in front of the Olympic Speed Skating Oval, which is across the street from Kearns High. How crazy is that? For real. Where I went to school and I took the flame from Steve Young, Hall of Fame football player. Wow. Proudest moment of my life. Okay. And I'm standing there, so you know, he passes the flame to me. And I've got this picture framed, and I'm sure you saw it. It's in the same room next to my torch where I'm holding this torch and tears are just streaming down my face. And I think the reason I was so overcome with emotion is because the spirit that follows that flame. Oh, yeah. That flame never goes out. That flame has been through so many countries and so many miles and been in so many people's hands. Oh, yeah. That spirit just touches your very soul. That's beautiful. And that's what it did for me that day. I was so overcome with emotion and you know, you have a support runner, so you don't trip and fall and drop it or anything like that. And, you know, I, I start taking off and I'm running. And my support runner goes, slow down. So I was like, okay. <laughs> so I start running slower. And as I'm running slower, I start to notice familiar faces in the crowd. The teachers from high school who never thought I was ever going to amount to anything. Wow. Those kids that bullied me because of my special circumstance were in that crowd, smiling, clapping, and cheering me on, as if they were so proud to know me. Yeah. And I said to myself in that moment, you have arrived. You're going to be okay. And I actually am writing a book called The Throwaway Girl. That's the opening to my book, because that is the moment that I truly was happy with myself and realized, I went through this for a reason, I'm gonna be okay. And one thing that I'm very proud of is that spirit that touched my soul with that flame is still inside of me. You. If you think about it, success is not your watch, your car, your store, your clothes. Success is what you can inspire other people to do. For real. So I hope that my story helps inspire others to feed their flame. Because that's what it's all about. Feeding each other's flame. Heck yeah, it is. I know yeah. you definitely just inspired me. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> that's beautiful. That's amazing. And, and I love how you're still keeping that torch lit and alive and, yeah. and, and bringing that to people. That's amazing. It's an amazing story. And I can't wait till the book comes out and can read it have you on again and Thank you. have a signed copy. Yeah, it's been, I've been working on it since I was 18 years old, so 20 years now. Wow. So I'm on the very final end of it. Um, but, uh, you know, one thing I want to do is, with my book, it's, it's a labor of love in a sense that it's another platform for me to share my message. Oh, yeah. So I want the proceeds of the book to go back into the nonprofit. Right. Because that's... You know, the story is, it's called the throwaway girl because that's kind of a term for people who've been in foster care. They're called the throwaway kids. And I was told repeatedly, you know, by my mother and father, you're a piece of, hopefully I can say the shit, or um, I wish we could have had an abortion or thrown you away. And so I felt very disposable to my parents. Yeah. And so that's why I chose that title. But the book's not about focusing on the abuse. The book is about focusing on how I've overcome it and turned it into lighting my flame and being able to run that torch. So the start of the book is running the torch and the end of the book is running the torch because it's the beginning and the end of great things. That's awesome, I like that. Yeah. <laughs> Very inspirational and motivational. <laughs> yeah, I love it. Heck yeah, well, 
Uh, thank you, you know, again so much for this time and information, your energy, and, and greatly appreciate it. And before we get going again, could you give out all your links, your website, all your social medias? And, sure. and when she does, everyone, please uh, follow, like, subscribe, comment, and share. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yes, uh, I'd love for you guys to share the movement. So sharethemovement.org is the website for the nonprofit. If you want to follow us on Instagram for the nonprofit, it is at share the movement, I believe. And then for Facebook, you're just going to look for sharing hope for the abuse through resilience and empowerment. Now, as far as my personal social media, did you want me to share that? Sure, if you want to. So. Um, my Instagram is at Lady Airbnb because that's what I do in my day job is I help people in real estate set up Airbnbs. And then my Facebook, you can just find me under Miss M-I-S-S Tiffany Barnes. So, Heck yeah. Have you. Well, again, thank, thank you so you. much. And thank you, everyone, uh, for tuning in. And much love and respect. Thank you.